Okay, good evening. Welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Peter Kriva, the Aquarium of Pacific, and this is uh, these first Wednesdays have become one of my favorite parts of the job because I love the conversations afterward and I love hearing the talks. So, so tonight we have Amber Sparks. Uh, she's a degree in marine conservation biology and from Berkeley and Scripps. And I'm not going to give a fancy introduction other than when we were looking for speakers, I went on the website and saw some videos and read the materials and I was just both sort of blown away by the, by the imagination, but the photography and the energy. And so I'm, I'm really good, glad to welcome her up here. She'll give her talk and afterwards there'll be an opportunity for questions. Um, and uh, we'll be probably about 10 minutes for questions. And then we go out on the first floor and there's cocktails and conversation. And I'm sure Adina has some, something for us to play with while we're out there too, some art project or something. And it's a good chance to, you know, just sort of ruminate and talk about what we've done. So Amber, thank you so much for uh, driving up here and being willing to do this. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Good evening, everyone. My name is Amber Sparks. I'm a marine conservation biologist and co-president of the Blue Latitudes Foundation, where we work to find opportunities for conservation at the intersection of industry and the environment. Rigs as Reefs is an excellent example of this. And today, I'm gonna to share with you a story that's a little different than what you may think you know about the realities of offshore oil and gas development and decommissioning here in California, and how we can reimagine our energy past as our eco-friendly future. In California, there are 27 offshore oil and gas platforms. These platforms are made of steel, and they look like big industrial giants out there. And all these platforms have booming ecosystems that exist below the surface. Today, our story starts at the surface, where in California, we see 27 offshore oil and gas platforms. They span from offshore Los Angeles up to just north of Santa Barbara. You may have even seen them driving up along the one freeway. These platforms from our beach chair look like menacing industrial giants, and they've been offshore for decades, extracting offshore oil and gas resources. But as our blue economy shifts from oil and gas to renewable resources, the decommissioning of these platforms is imminent. And the potential implications from an economic and ecological perspective is something very interesting to dive into. Oil companies have begun to ask themselves what to do when the oil wells dry up, when these resources are no longer economically viable to extract. Enter the engineering feat of a lifetime, how to remove a structure some the size of the Empire State Building from the seafloor. This process is called decommissioning, and it involves sealing and capping the wells, and then removing all of the drilling infrastructure. That includes both the top side, so this top side facility, as well as the beams and cross beams of the jacket structure that have been supporting the drilling platform over its entire life. Now this process of decommissioning can be technically challenging and costly, but there also are some very interesting economic or ecological implications when we look beneath the surface. Here in California, every beam and cross beam is covered in life, 
We see scallops, anemones, schools of jack mackerel. We even see some of our state's saltwater fish, the Garibaldi, that nest and make their permanent home on these structures. You may recognize this fish from just walking around and visiting the aquarium's exhibits. Rigs to Reef provides an alternative to completely removing that platform jacket. So the wells will be sealed and capped in the exact same way, but and the, the drilling platform or what you would see above the surface is removed. But the scaffolding of the jacket, the beams and cross beams, that is modified so that it can remain in the water column to function as an artificial reef. Through a rigs to reef decommissioning scenario, scenario, there are a couple of options. First, they can topple this structure on its side, or they could tow it to an area of ecosystem need, or remove the upper 85 feet so that ships can safely draft over. Whichever decommissioning option is selected, those wells are always sealed and capped, and the oil companies actually retain liability for those wells in perpetuity. So should there ever be a leak or spill, they are always responsible. But the platform jacket is modified and managed as an artificial reef so that it can continue to serve the local ecosystems. But before I get too far ahead of myself, let's take a step back and ask, well, what really is an artificial reef? Because not everything that we place in the ocean can be considered a good candidate to be a reef. Scientists have asked this question by placing reef balls on the seafloor to look at how the marine life colonizes these structures. Scientists are especially interested in artificial reefs as their purpose is to mimic the natural environment. So we like to understand how colonization and growth can happen on an artificial structure. Artists have their own take and place installations on the seafloor to admire how the marine life that grows there enhances their art. But what makes an oil platform such a good candidate for an artificial reef? The secret really lies in the structure itself. Ranging from seafloor to sea surface, there's a lot of real estate, nooks and crannies for marine life to colonize and grow on. And these complex latticework structures create an excellent foundation for marine ecosystems to develop. Here, you see many scallops and anemones on that beam. This is an important part of California's platforms. The scallops and mussel shells, when they die, they fall to the base of the platform and form these enormous shell mounds. The shell mounds function as nursery habitat for some threatened species of rockfish. And once those rockfish reach maturity, they move up to some of the higher regions of the platform. And therefore, these structures are unique in that they can function in an entire cycle of life. In fact, after over 20 years of researching these platforms, scientists from UC Santa Barbara have found these platforms are some of the most productive ecosystems on the planet. In fact, in some locations, these platforms have the ability to rebound fisheries populations, especially those that are impacted, such as the rockfish, where some of their natural, natural reef and nearshore environments are being degraded, and therefore they've been moving offshore and making their permanent home on these structures. But we really have to ask ourselves, are these structures truly essential fish habitat? What I mean by that is, are these structures allowing for fish to spawn, breed, and grow to maturity? Now, to answer this question, we really get faced with the age-old question of production versus attraction. Is this artificial reef just attracting species that are swimming by, or are they functioning as a source of production for marine life? Now, we can answer this question by going into the gut of the fish. You are what you eat, and we can trace what the fish has eaten back to the platform or natural reef habitat. I always love looking at the platforms in California, but we're not the only ones that have offshore structures, so we're going to take a look at some of the global potential here. 
Here you see a map of the globe, and the red and blue represent oil and gas reserves. As you can see, these resources are highly concentrated along the shoreline and offshore. In fact, in every ocean right now, we are actively extracting offshore oil and gas resources. So with this much development, you would think that a rigs to reef decommissioning alternative might be something that's widely accepted at an international level, but it's really not the case. There are only a few places that have rigs to reef programs and some that are just developing. First, we'll take a look at California where, as we know, we have 27 platforms. Many of them are vibrant reef ecosystems. And back in 2010, former Governor Schwarzenegger signed in Assembly Bill 2503 that it would allow for these structures to be repurposed as reefs. But since its signing, none of our platforms have been reefed. And some of those issues lie in the intricacies of the law, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Our next stop is going to take us over to the Gulf of Mexico. The Gulf of Mexico is the birthplace of the Rigs to Reef program. They've been reefing structures for over 30 years and have over 500 successfully reefed platforms that are managed by the states of Texas and Louisiana. Now, our next stop is going to be in Southeast Asia, where they've innovated this idea of Rigs to Reef by repurposing a structure for ecotourism. They've left the entire structure in place, including the top side, and retrofitted that top side into an ecotourism resort. So divers can come and stay above the structure and then dive the platform reef as well as the surrounding reef. Another area in the South China Sea over in the Gulf of Thailand they are recently developing their own rig reef programs. Thailand actually just approved its first platform to be a reefing candidate. But this took many years to get to that place. For them, they, it was very important to work with both the regulators and the fisheries stakeholders to make sure that any reef structure would be truly benefiting all stakeholders. Our last stop is going to be, thank you, off the coast of Gabon in West Africa, where Dr. Enrique Sala, a National Geographic explorer, went and dove on these platforms. And what he found is while trawling had decimated the fishing populations in the vicinity of the structures, these structures themselves were hot spots for life. And his research got those platforms incorporated into Africa's largest marine park. Welcome back from your trip. Now, we are just going to overview some of those places that we visited, starting with the Gulf of Mexico, the birthplace of this program. The Riggs Reef program really came about because in the Gulf of Mexico, it was once a vast, relatively featureless, sandy bottom. And it wasn't until oil and gas was discovered there in the 40s that a network of artificial reefs was installed through all these platforms. And it really transformed the Gulf into a, an area where there's red snapper rebounding and several important fisheries. So when decommissioning came around, they wanted to ensure that they could keep some of that hard substrate provided by the platforms to ensure the stability of their fisheries. Now, I also like to take a look at the North Sea. The North Sea has several hundreds of platforms, but the environment there is very um, tumultuous. You don't want to get in the water. It's even colder than California. And therefore, there's been very little research on the value of these platforms as reefs there. Without that research, without understanding what's below the surface, you really can't establish a rigs to reef program, and therefore, there's a lot of potential there, but little progress. Next stop, I want to look at the Southeast Asia um, Sea Ventures dive rig that was repurposed as an ecotourism resort. This is a very interesting idea. Many people want to know if they can completely retrofit one of these structures for, let's say, offshore wind or energy development or research station or even a dive hotel. And so it's a great case study to see how this has been done and what makes it successful. And lastly, we are here in California where former Governor Schwarzenegger signed in Assembly Bill 2503. And 
this bill came about because decommissioning was on the forefront of um, the conversations in offshore development. And this bill was designed to allow for an alternative such as reefing. However, there are a couple issues in the legislation itself that have limited it from being actionable. Primarily, it's the liability for the structure itself. For, well, if you remember, I said the liability for the wells remains with the oil companies in perpetuity. The structure, so the beams and cross beams, where the artificial reef is growing, the liability for that structure could either be donated to the state or remain with the oil companies. And without a distinction on who is going to retain that liability, neither party are stepping up and saying, let's make this happen. And as a result, none of our platforms have been reefed. When I talk about liability for the platform jacket or that jacket structure, what I mean is the expense of and the obligation of maintenance and repair, as well as any, any legal requirements that might come up if, let's say, a fisherman entangles his net or loses gear on a structure. There's also some maintenance costs in terms of maintaining a buoy, a navigational buoy. When it comes to the liability for the wells, that includes any sort of damage to the marine environment, as well as ensuring the integrity of those wells. And the, owner, the liability for the wells does remain with oil companies. It's important to note that there is a financial component to this. For you can imagine if a part of a structure is left in the water column, there might be some cost savings. Well, in California, that cost savings is rather significant. In fact, if 23 of our 27 platforms were reefed, there would be an influx of over 650 to $850 million back to the state of California into an endowment for marine preservation and conservation. That's one of the aspects of the law that I really like. And that money would go to fund Department of Fish and Wildlife as well as state fund ocean conservation, state run ocean conservation initiatives. Now, while that might sound like a lot, it's part of a total $1 billion in saved costs. So there is a portion of that cost savings that remains with the oil company operators. Now, let's take a closer look into some of the pros and cons. We'll start with the con of a lack of global legislation. For a while, the Gulf of Mexico has a successful reefing program with over 500 successful reefs that are being managed by Departments of Fish and Wildlife in Louisiana and Texas. That doesn't mean that that program is going to work here in California or in the Gulf of Thailand. We all have different stakeholders that need to be involved. So without this general legislation, it can, there can be some issues to actually getting this program up and running. Another con we see is, what's the carrying capacity of our oceans? At what point does leaving these structures out there just become ocean dumping? We don't want to just say that you can place things in our oceans. Off of the coast of New York, they are putting subway, or they're putting um, subway cars in Florida, they're dumping tires, and we need to be really careful about what we're putting in our oceans and ensure that it doesn't create a negative impact. The beauty of the Riggs to Reef program is that these structures are already there, and the reefs have already established. And they studied this in the Gulf of Mexico, and they saw that there was only about 2 to 3 percent of the hard substrate was being provided by the oil and gas structures. So it wasn't necessarily doing a negative impact at this point. Another con we see is invasive species. This is a picture of an Indo-Pacific lionfish which is invasive to the Gulf of Mexico, which is where I took this picture. Now, the Gulf of Mexico has many hundreds, thousands of structures, and they are acting as stepping stones for the spread of invasive species, such as this lionfish. However, researchers have studied this in the Gulf, and they found that while they are facilitating the spread of invasives, they aren't doing it at a rate that's any greater than the natural reefs. Another important con we see is a lack of public understanding. For when most of us think about offshore oil and gas here in California, 
Maybe we're reminded of the Santa Barbara oil spill or many negative impacts that these structures have had on our communities. And it's hard to imagine, unless you dove on one of these platforms or studied it or perhaps attended this lecture, that there could possibly be a reef beneath the surface. And that's a big part of the work that I do, is, con is communicating the science behind these structures and the reefs that they support. And lastly, a con we see is that if we leave these structures in place, they become an obstruction on the seafloor and potentially limit other ocean users from accessing that area. You think of a trawl fisherman. They want to have open access to the seafloor. And with these structures in the way, they do not get to have that same type of access. It's important that any reef structure has balance and consensus with other stakeholders. Now we'll take a look at some of the pros and the potential for these structures to enhance our local fisheries. This is especially relevant here in California as we continue to degrade our nearshore natural reefs with runoff, pollution, overfishing. What we're finding is that many species are moving offshore and making their permanent home on these structures. Another pro we see is that these structures in California are massive. They're some of the largest oil platforms in the world. And completely removing that structure from the seafloor, we need to come and be dismantled and recycled onshore. However, in California, we actually don't have the infrastructure in place to properly recycle a structure that large. As a result, it would be cut into many pieces and placed on the back of a barge and sent to another area to be dismantled, perhaps across the Pacific to Southeast Asia or even down to Mexico. And the second that those barges go outside of state waters, they switch from diesel to bunker fuel. Bunker fuel makes diesel look like champagne, and as many of you may know, just from all of the large transit vessels and barges that we have currently off our coastline, there's a significant carbon footprint associated with those emissions. So if we can limit those emissions by repurposing these structures as reefs, that could be a pro. Another important pro that we see is the potential economic benefits. Reefing a structure does save the oil companies money. But with our rigs to reef law, 65 to 85% of that cost savings goes back to the state into an endowment for marine preservation to fund departments of fish and wildlife and other state-run conservation initiatives. Lastly, there's the pro of ecotourism. Diving on these platforms is truly a unique and exciting dive. It draws in people from around the world. There's also excellent recreational fishing opportunities, and if these structures were reefed, they could remain a recreational asset. But I really want to take a closer look at what a successful rigs to reef program would look like here in California, because not every one of our platforms is a good candidate. There are several components that we need to take a look at. First would be structural complexity. The more complex a structure is, the more nooks and crannies exist that attract marine life. And a, a complex structure is more likely to be a successful artificial reef. Placement is critical in California. We have some structures that are as shallow as 100 feet to as deep as 1,200 feet. If you're, in a sh if you're a shallow platform and we remove the upper 85 feet so that ships can safely draft over you, that's not a lot of reef left on the seafloor. And so we need to recognize that maybe that wouldn't be a good candidate to be reefed, or at least not reefed through that reefing methodology. Years in the water column is also very important. The longer a reef has been established, the more complex it, it becomes. Reefing methodologies are very important to consider. Like I mentioned, we don't want to cut off 85 feet on a 100-foot platform. It just doesn't really make sense. We need to ensure, though, if we topple a structure on its side, that it doesn't get in the way of an important trawl fishing ground. So these are all the types of considerations that need to be made. There are many stakeholders and considerations before a reef can truly be considered successful. And that does take me to stakeholder engagement. 
we are not, offshore oil and gas is, of course, not the only ocean user out there. And it's so important that we consider all of the stakeholders' needs and align correctly with them so that any offshore activity doesn't create a negative impact. So this is a little map of California's coastline, and the triangles represent the oil and gas platforms. The black platforms are active, and the red are inactive. Now, federal regulation requires that once a structure becomes inactive, that the plug and abandonment of those wells begin relatively immediately. So many of our offshore platforms are actually being plugged and abandoned at this moment. After the wells are safely plugged and abandoned, then the oil operator will make a decision about how to remove or reef a the platform jacket, that structure that we've been talking about. And so rigs to reef is a, and decommissioning is something that we may see in the next five to 10 years. Or even sooner than that, because Platform Holly is currently being decommissioned as we speak. Platform Holly is a shallow water structure in state waters. It was formerly owned by Venico, which went bankrupt. And when it went bankrupt, it was given back to the state to be managed and decommissioned. So now the California State, the California state Lands Commission has the jurisdiction and the liability of decommissioning Platform Holly. They're currently plugging and abandoning the wells and they'll soon be releasing public documents to get comments back as well as do an environmental assessment of what the best decommissioning alternative will be for this particular platform. So stay tuned for that. What we find is that implementing Riggs Reef in California could provide a viable alternative to the status quo of complete removal and could also be a replicable and scalable solution to catalyze some of the sustainable ocean development that I know our state is working towards. Again, my name is Amber Sparks and I am co-president of the Blue Latitudes Foundation. It's important that we continue these conversations and please feel free to reach out to me at amber at bluelatitudes.org or check out our website, Blue Latitudes Foundation. We're also on social media. Would love to have you follow us along this journey as we really dive into some of the important issues here at the intersection of industry and the environment. Thank you. Yes, so the question was, they wanted to, wants to know a little bit more about the Sea Ventures dive rig. It's off of Brunei, specifically off the port of Semporna. And the Sea Ventures dive rig is a jack-up rig, which means it's only got six legs, doesn't have a lot of the beams and cross beams or that complexity. My co-president and I visited that structure and did an expedition to research the platform there. And after diving in California, we were expecting quite a robust ecosystem. But when we rolled over the surface, we realized it was not what we expected. And while that was surprising for us, it really also validated this point that not every platform is a good candidate to be considered an artificial reef. That complexity is so important, as well as placement. This structure was placed in a sedimented environment. And as we know, artificial reefs mimic their natural environment. So if you place it in a sedimented environment, it's not going to have a vibrant reef ecosystem that exists. So that and that's a little bit more about that platform. Oh, your other part of that question was if it's the only one. There is another platform that's been repurposed as a bed and breakfast off of South Carolina. A private investor purchased it. And it's also infamously known as the most dangerous bed and breakfast because you have to take a helicopter out there and 
it's kind of shaky, salt water showers. Um, so I don't know if that's as successful as the warm waters of Semporna. What is the name of the bed and breakfast? <laughs> <laughs> yes. If I tell you, I'm afraid you're going to go. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes. Okay. Off of, you know what, I, I actually don't know the name of it. I think because it is privately owned, it may be an invitation only uh, platform. Hello. Hi, I'm wondering, um, so while the platform is operating, they're doing cathodic protection on the platform and actually saw some of the sacrificial anodes in your pictures. Who's in charge of maintaining that so that the structure doesn't just oxidize and then collapse on the reef structure? That's great. Yeah, where are you? I can't find you. Over there. Oh, there. Thank you. Sorry. So the question was about cathodic protection. Some of you might have, rec oh, not in this picture, but there are these cathodic protection anodes on the structure that help to prevent or slow down the corrosion rate. This is very important because these structures are made of steel and the integrity of these structures is paramount, especially when they're actively drilling for offshore oil and gas resources. You would never want one of these structures to crumble underneath the weight of the platform. Once a platform is reefed, those anodes are not maintained, but rather left to their own devices. Some people worry, okay, well, how is that going to impact the integrity of the structure? Well, because the platforms in California are so encrusted, encrusted with marine life, the invertebrates create a natural slowdown of the oxidization process. And they've looked at how long these structures could remain in the water column uh, before needing any kind of maintenance, and it was between 200 to 300 years. But we really don't have an example of what to, how else to really compare this besides looking at shipwrecks or other pieces of man-made structures that have been placed in the water column. So they're studying this right now, and their thought is that it would be between 200 to 300 years. Hi. Uh -huh. My name is Val, and I have a question regarding the active oil rigs in Long Beach. I notice that they all seem to be indicated to be active. Have you any idea how long these are going to last? Yes. So the platforms off of Long Beach are in the E field. Ellie, Ellen, Eureka, Edith, these platforms are some of the most productive platforms in California. While some of the more northern wells and resources are slowly depleting and really not providing much of a income for those companies, the E field is productive. And therefore, there is not a immediate desire to decommission those structures. However, there has been a recent incident along the pipeline and those structures um, there's a little bit of uncertainty in how the future um, decommissioning of these structures or that timeline may progress. But at this point, they are not slated to be decommissioned within the next 10 to 15 years. Uh, how come they need to be uh, removed below the waterline? Wouldn't it be just as effective to leave a portion of it out of the water, easier to maintain, certainly easier to see by shipping, fisheries, et cetera, et cetera, without having to worry about the thing being marked and, uh, you know, maintain that and just take the top off and leave 20 or 30 feet up and there you go and then mark that. Exactly. That, that's a great question. So the U.S. Coast Guard has mandated that the structures be cut down to 85 feet to ensure that ships can safely draft over without causing any sort of impact. However, while that might be a 
viable idea for the Gulf of Mexico. Here in California, some of our fisheries stakeholders have actually come out to say that if a platform is reefed, they would like to see a portion of the topside in place, even if it's just a deck. And that way, it becomes a navigational buoy, a landmark for those fishermen, and it could potentially decrease any sort of impact or um, issues because you would be seeing that structure in place. I think it's a better alternative. Yes. Yes, and when they do look at decommissioning these structures, they do an environmental assessment process that looks at a variety of different alternatives. So that could be one of the alternatives that is discussed. Hi, could you just uh, go back and explain a little bit more about the money? You said uh, it was something about if 23 of 27 of California's reefs were, or rigs were reefed, the, the state would save money, several hundred yeah. billion, million yeah, yeah. Let me, out of a billion. I can yeah. absolutely go over that again. Decommissioning is very expensive in California for a couple of reasons. We do not have the large vessels required to decommission. We also don't have a lot of the onshore facilities that do that decommissioning. So compared to the price to decommission in the Gulf of Mexico where all of those resources are available, California's prices skyrocket and they continue to every single year. If 23 of California's 27 platforms were to be reefed, there would be a total $1 billion in saved costs. Now, 65 to 85% of that saved costs would go back to the state. So that's anywhere between 650 to $850 million to the state into an endowment for marine preservation and conservation. And that comes from That comes from the oil companies. Yes, so when an oil company gets a lease to drill, they're required to post bond to decommission. That means that they hold the, the responsibility for removing and safely plugging, and plugging and abandoning the wells. And so that bond would be used um, partially, if not wholly, to cover any of those costs to the state. When the decision making in terms of decommissioning, does the industry really, have they developed a profile or are they really, do they favor it or they're in, you know, does the state have more say? Who has a decision making process and what is the industry stance on reefing? The oil industry. The oil industry's stance on reefing is that they really don't want to promote it because they don't want to be seen as greenwashing or saying that, hey, our oil platforms are great reefs, let's leave them in place and save a billion dollars. Like, so they're just not promoting it in any way, really. Not funding re a lot of research behind it. And as a result, the primary research that's done on this is, comes out of UC Santa Barbara and Dr. Milton Love's lab. And the decisions around if a structure is reefed comes from both the federal and state level. The most important player in that is the state. Because if you remember that issue around the liability of the platform jacket, if a structure were to be reefed, it's very likely that the state would have to come to some sort of agreement with the oil company that they would take on liability for that structure and manage it as they would on any other artificial reef. Because that's what's been done successfully in the Gulf of Mexico. But at this point, I don't think that our departments of fish and wildlife have, de well, I know that they have not developed a rigs to reef program, and therefore there's many hurdles, many administrative hurdles to actualizing that. Um, there was a presentation here a couple years ago um, on this subject. And one of the things that was brought up then was that this, um, the assembly bill that you referred to, it hasn't been funded. And th this is part of what's keeping it from going forward. Is, is that true? Well, it has been passed. 
So it, it is officially law right now. But my question is that it, it's, been, it's been said that while it is passed, it doesn't have the funding to be enacted. Is that so? Oh, okay, I see. So that, I think behind that, what they mean is that there's not the funding to develop that Riggs Reef program in the Department of, Cal of um, California's Department of Fish and Wildlife. So there is going to be some startup costs because we can't just start this reefing program out of thin air. There needs to be some development. And you're correct, there hasn't been any funding available to, to supply the Department of Fish and Wildlife with the staff and the resources to make that a re uh, reality. Hi, good evening. Um, thank you for this talk. This has been really, really cool. Um, my question, and this may be not as applicable in the ocean as it is in the terrestrial world, but if removing a portion of the platform structure to a totally different location, um, is there a concern for introducing invasives to like a different area or maybe a disruption in sedimentation that exists from one location to another? Yes, that's a great question. Yes. So if a structure has invasive species on it and you were to move it, especially one that has invasive corals, those can be easily transferred and you would be spreading an invasive, yes. There are also issues with sedimentation. If you can imagine if you toppled this structure on its side, such a heavy weighted structure is going to have lots of sedimentation. And sedimentation can be really negative and disruptive to the environment. So those different options do need to be evaluated and I'm fairly certain that if a structure were to be reefed in California, it would be through the leave in place method where only the upper, either portion of the upper part is removed and that only that section is brought on shore. Um, I have a question about Platform Holly. I believe it's off Carpinteria. Venico went bankrupt. So who would bear the financial responsibility of decommissioning it? That's a great question. So I'm gonna answer that in two parts. The first is around the wells. Because as I said, the oil companies always retain liability for the well. Well, what if the company goes bankrupt? Then who's liable? It actually goes down to who keeps falling back ownership until it gets back to the original owner who drilled that well. Many of exploration wells are actually drilled by some of the major companies. So that's Ex Exxon, Shell, Chevron. And in the, place of, in the case of Platform Holly, that liability fell back on Exxon. So currently Exxon is executing the plug and abandonment of the wells at Platform Holly in collaboration with the California State Lands Commission. Because Venico went bankrupt and it is in state waters and under state jurisdiction, the liability for decommissioning did fall back on the state. Now the state Department of, or the State California State Lands Commission did receive bond money as part of Venico, Venico's bankruptcy, but that bond money could o only cover a partial, um, partial amount of the cost. So Exxon is bearing the cost, a significant part of the cost, to plug in and abandon the wells, make sure it's done in a safe manner. And over the next couple of years, California State Lands Commission will lead the environmental review process to determine the decommissioning strategy for the actual platform jacket at Holly. Look like, whoa, look like there was many platforms that were in the federal waters versus state waters. So I was wondering for those platforms that are in the federal water, for the, the amount of money that goes back to the state as well as the liability, is that only true for the state platforms and not the federal? That's a, that's a great question. It applies to all the platforms. And so in the Gulf, of, and same in the Gulf of Mexico, they, you find platforms over 200 miles offshore, so that's way outside of the three nautical, nautical mile state boundary. 
and whichever um, localized jurisdiction they fall under in federal waters, they'll be associated with that state. So any federal decommissioning would have to coordinate with the state. Clarification on the liability framework in the Gulf of Mexico, and if that's also bifurcated with the wells in the jacket, and who retains the liability there? Yes, so in the Gulf of Mexico, the wells re remain with the oil company, and the jacket remains or becomes the liability of the state. So if that jacket is in Texas waters, it will be the jurisdiction of Texas Department of Fish and Wildlife. If it's in Louisiana, it's Louisiana's Department of Fish and Wildlife. And it's important to note that both of those states, as well as Alabama have, and Mississippi, have rigs to reef programs that are funded and run under the Department of Fish and Wildlife. And so those departments are what do the annual maintenance um, and really maintain all of the, the reef structures. We only have time for one more question. <laughs> so not a question but more I just wanted to say thank you my last semester at my junior college we got an assignment to talk about whatever we wanted to and I really wanted to talk about rigs to reefs and when I saw this that the aquarium in the Pacific was going to give a presentation of rigs to reefs I remember seeing your face and actually seeing a video of you of um, on, on like a little boat and like swimming in full gear. And I just wanted to say thank you because you actually were in my paper and I couldn't remember. Wow. wow. Um, and I just wanted to say thanks, but I, oh yeah, I do have a question. Californians are very knowledgeable when it comes to voting. How do we inform them? How can we bring this knowledge besides telling them like, hey, there is an event at the Aquarium in the Pacific. Are you willing to spend and drive out here? Mm -hmm. um, I think these are amazing. If it wasn't for me being and falling in love with the ocean and wanting to pursue one associate's degree in marine science, but then pursuing a business degree, um, and then coming out here because of my still my love of the ocean and wanting to uh, and wanting to fall even more with sustainability and living my life of sustainability. How can I be a better Californian and let people know about rigs to reefs besides writing another paper? And by the way, your presentation was phenomenal. My paper is like a kindergarten punk compared to what you did. Um, I couldn't, I feel so ashamed because I couldn't even give you credit to okay. the presentation that you did. Well, thank you. I believe that as Californians, we all have a love for the ocean. I think that's what really, at least in many cases, what really draws us to this state is our pristine coastlines and the resources that they provide. And I think all of us care deeply about protecting those resources. Because of that, so do our legislators. And this is, I know, an issue that is very important to them. And we can all be involved by informing our legislators, letting them know what their constitu constituents feel about offshore oil and gas decommissioning and the alternatives that are available there. We have a petition on our website that's funded by Patagonia. And so if you go to our website, you can sign it. And it is letting some of our local legislators know that we want a rigs to reef alternative to be seriously considered in the state. And so that's one way that you can get involved. I think sharing your love for the ocean and talking to those around you about some of these complicated issues, especially one around oil and gas. It's not a, your normal save the whales or, um, you know, fun ocean topic. It's kind of unusual. And so communicating and talking to others about what you've learned is also a really great way to 
give back and continue the conversation around these issues. Well, I want to thank Amber a lot. You, she thank answered you. more questions than anybody should have to answer. Thanks. Oh, that was terrific. Yes. That was thank you. Good um, night. Afterwards, as I said, there's uh, cocktails and conversation. And is there art? Is there art? Uh, but please enter, please exit down here on the first floor and go out that way. And I have one more announcement. The, the next first Wednesday had to be rescheduled because of the parking situation and the Grand Prix. So we'll skip for a month. I'll be heartbroken. But then after that, we're going to have a Seafood for the Future one in um, May. So thank you very much, Amber, and have some conversation about this. I think we all learned a lot.